<clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hi. I think I probably see, saw all of you down at the car at least once to the, uh, over the past couple of days. Um, my name is Steve Wallace, and uh, that is Ed Shadel. If you have anything to say. He's probably not going to let me talk a lot. I, 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 I sometimes part of the, uh, my, okay, so my name's Ed Shadow. I, I just said that. <laughs> I wasn't paying any attention to you. All right. All right. Anyway, yeah, I don't but, think it's turned out. But, well, like, you know, let me turn the gain up. I'm, I'm a sound guy, too, so uh, it's okay. I'm a professional. Two, four, six, eight. That's better. Hey, How's that? Okay, check. I can live with it. All right. Yep. All right. Very good. Well, it, it helps because of my voice. Oh, after that uh, party last night, I'll be yelling. You know, I can hardly talk today. But anyway, yeah, we're, we're uh, building and testing the fastest car in the world. And it's named the North American Eagle. Uh, and uh, as you may have seen downstairs, it's a F-104 Starfighter <coughs> that we're modifying to be a world... Uh, land speed a record holder hopefully in the, within the next couple of years or a year and a half or something like that but uh, we've been through a long arduous process and what I wanted to do in this session um, because it's a little it's a longer session because I wanted to get into kind of the nitty-gritty not, not only get you a, a flavor for all of the of the testing um, uh, aspects of this as related to data acquisition and and the, and the scientific aspect. I also wanted to give you a flavor of, of um, <clears throat> what we've had to do um, with basically nothing to accomplish the impossible. And uh, this is a, a team that is not paid. We're all volunteers, and all of the equipment is donated uh, or borrowed, and uh, we're stolen. Or, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I want, I want to, I want to get, get started and, and talk about they asked me to, to get involved uh, with this car and you can see uh, in this picture that uh, it wasn't in great shape. Okay. Uh, they wanted me to collect data. Ed and, Ed and Keith asked me to come on board and, and give them some help with some sensors. I didn't know I was going to be spending the next, uh, every Saturday for the next eight years working on the project. Mm -hmm. More years to come. Better, more years. You better not be out of <laughs> I'm sure there are, at least it'll keep us, uh, keep us alive. Anyway, uh, yeah, they collect data, but uh, do a lot of other things. And, by the way, it's not quite finished yet. Uh, we've got to make this thing into something that's going to go 800 miles per hour and, uh, and, uh, don't har and not harm the driver in any way. And we only have one of them, so we can't break it. <laughs> I'm almost afraid to ask in this crowd, but I think it might be revealing. How many people know where the quote, building mnemonic memory circuits using stone knives and bear skins comes from? Star Trek. Let me see hands. Star Trek. Uh, yeah. With the time machine. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I think they're, maybe they're, the other geeks are kind of shy. They don't identify. Yeah. But it's basically, uh, yeah, we're trying to do the impossible with nothing. Uh, we've, we've got to, we've got a lot of stuff to deal with. We've got sensors, uh, we've got, uh, I don't need to read the list for you, you can most likely read it, but uh, everything from satellite tracking, uh, power storage, fire sensors, none of that existed, and it had to exist. We had really bad, we have really bad environments to deal with. Here's a picture of uh, our NAE, National, uh, North American Eagle Data Acquisition Team getting ready for a run. Ed's in the cockpit. And here's the hero driver. Hero driver. <laughs> Thumbs up, Ed. We're ready to go. <laughs> and uh, it, the wind, oh. it is, it, I felt sorry for the cameramen. Look at these guys out here. 70 mile hour winds. Oh. And they're out there with high-end cameras. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're cleaning their lenses with uh, grit. Uh, there's the DAC team. Uh, we're on. I'm the DAC team. Me, uh, under their uh, 
uh, under the vehicle, it's uh, these guys are out, out getting dinner, and uh, it's freezing. It is dipping down to desert temperatures, and uh, I've got uh, burned up wiring to replace. Um, is that the time we worked until three in the morning to fix it? No, that was another time. <laughs> that was Edwards. Uh, extreme heat. Now uh, this was, uh, I think, actually this is El Mirage, but we, yeah, El Mirage. Yeah. And uh, we we saw see deeper temperatures out there. Like I say, 118 wasn't uncommon. Of course, think about it. I've got a. a you know how your vehicle gets hot when it sits out in the sunshine. Well, we've got everything closed up, and I've got a data acquisition system uh, that has to stay alive. Um, I I was young then. <laughs> Not only that, in this picture, you see the start car. That's what we used to start the car. Typical M32-60 start car to use on aircraft. And uh, that was that was so hot out there that the batteries in it boiled off, and we couldn't start the car without actually taking it and uh, wrapping all that in uh, wet towels and then icing you know, the batteries and the turbine section down so we could start the car. Well, and and to, to give you an idea, okay, we're we have to uh, hustle wires around, put it umbilicals in. It's it's hot work. We're out there in this blazing sun, and I've got a uh, a battery that is going, it's on battery power at this point. Um, clock's ticking, and if he doesn't get started, I'm going to lose. I'm not going to have a battery left in order to run some of the sensors that I have, and um, you know, suddenly we can't start the car. So it's a big rush to go around, get everything plugged back in over and over again. That's probably the second hardest I've ever worked in my entire life. And the first hardest is coming up. <laughs> Extreme vibration. This is an afterburner test we were doing at a local uh, um, airport. I, met, I, was, uh, I stood 300 yards, or 300 feet off the, uh, the port side with a instrumentation recorder and a DB meter. I wanted to get an accurate recording of the sonic, um, the, the noise from the afterburner. I couldn't use a, a ready, regular audio recorder because the dynamic, dynamic range was uh, you know, large enough. But I measured that at 126 dB at 300 feet. At 300 feet. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the other thing is our HD cameras, those nice fancy $800 cameras, as soon as they go into afterburner, their cameras would shut off. Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they, uh, if they're recording to the hard drive, of course, there's a, there's a little accelerometer in there. When it sees acceleration, it lifts the head up so it doesn't crash. So just the vibration was keeping the, keeping the heads from writing. Uh, the other thing is, um, I just wanted to mention what a thrill it is to have a, uh, a, a generator problem. And then I have to shimmy on my back under here reach up through a little panel and put two electrodes on the, on the, on the measure the voltage and then, then he goes into, into full power with my hands up in there. And that's just, you know, that is a bone-shaking experience, I tell you. Yeah. Very glad it was him. And, and you need to experience it sometime. I don't have to. <laughs> I own the car. <laughs> and and as, you, as we'll get into this, and we're going to have to get going because I do want to get into it, is uh, connectivity. How am I going to connect with that and, and preserve my data and communicate with him um, when I may be able to get everything started, but then he's, I can't catch him. My Subaru only does 135 on a good day and he's gone. So um, I've got connectivity problems that we had to solve. And we collect all kinds of data and because we need all kinds of information. You see that we need aero, uh, and as I mentioned downstairs to many of you, uh, our, my key uh, goal is to get air pressure data that we can compare with the computational fluid dynamics model. So we can see if our model is accurate enough to give ourselves permission to go faster and uh, do it in a safe manner. So air pressure readings uh, are, are rate about the machine, um, we performance of the pilot, in regards to driving, uh, I've got a, 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 a sensor on the stick that tells me where the stick position is, also on the steering mechanism, so we can see whether the leads are lax or, or, or movement that's not commanded or commands that don't result in movement. And I'll show you, I've got data that I'll show you on that. And that's the steer box position, the velocities achieved through a global navigation satellite system. Um, I'm monitoring CPU temperatures because the 
computers pro I learned that the Pentium processor is it has got a little uh, algorithm in there that, that slows down the clock speed the warmer it gets until it finally just says I quit video in the cockpit it's amazing what you can capture with video with a lot of unexpected stuff. Yeah, we had video on the uh, rear struts to uh, watch the parachutes open, and we discovered in the process, we found out that our rear suspension was moving about. So we had some fixes to do to that, because we didn't know that. So I, I knew things were kind of wallowing around a bit, right. but uh, through cameras, we were able to pick up that. Right. Audio is always there. Uh, unexpected, bad things make bad noises, you know, and it's a, and uh, audio is a good way of syncing stuff too. I mean, nothing has changed since the day of the slapstick and starting movies. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the slap uh, that, that you can hear in the audio track is how they synchronize. They still synchronize uh, uh, video. You don't have a, a, uh, a reliable code break temperatures. Uh, we we had a magnetic braking in the back, not on this diagram, but uh, we need to know that we make sure that we don't uh, burn up our brakes. Tell you, this is the the beginning of the story, and, and uh, there's a, there's a lot to go, uh, a lot to do with how many computers I've been through. That was the first one with a uh, board that was um, donated by Intel, and, and that's the one that I figured uh, I got made all the I had all these lessons, uh, so it, it died. And I we wasted a lot of time and money out there uh, having the thing die and not getting any data. Unfortunately, one, one of the worst afternoons of my life. In, in, uh, yeah. How is that? The, the second most uh, uh, hardest day of my life and the, and the uh, probably, the, probably the second worst day of my life. There's you know. probably another one coming. Don't yes, worry. I know. But, you know, the solution was to go down to the Home Depot to the Aerospace Parts Division and the Parts yes. aisle and grab the Homer bucket and <laughs> take the Homer bucket and the bottle of great stuff and uh, uh, nest a couple of them together you know, and make a, a still that uh, we use for um, at IBM. These were cooling towers. <laughs> cooling towers. Yeah, no, it's not a still. It's a it's a uh, heat exchanger because I'm pumping glycol through the computer. Um, uh, now I'm I'm pumping glycol through the uh, uh, through the laptop and cooling it that way. Uh, this is a shot. It's, it's a little fuzzy, but you get the idea. Uh, we've uh, of our eBay with the old data acquisition system. It's a, it's a Larson Davis DSS system, um, which is a fine laboratory machine when they were making them. They no longer do, they no longer make parts, and they no longer have tech support. Um, I had three of them. I was down to one of them because I kept on borrowing parts to get this one to work, and it was time to, oh, it, it worked beautifully for what it did, but it was, it was dying, so, that's, that's where National Instruments uh, steps in and, and, and saved the day. Um, but you can see this fairly crowded. I'll, I might jump back to that picture, but here's the same area. And there's the Hero Compact DAC 9188 XT, uh, the hardened. Uh, <laughs> and uh, right there, uh, hard at work. Uh, this is the Global Navigation Satellite System. I'll get into that a little bit later. And uh, a water pump to a pump. Out of his air, yeah. This is this a fuel pump. gas pump. No, it's no water. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we decided not. Water's a bad idea in 17 degree weather, so it's pumping glycol now. And uh, so, in a water cool cooled laptop, the, I uh, took a pair of pliers and broke out the cooling fence and replaced it with a water manifold. We are collecting. What kind of temperatures were you dealing with in, in, uh, in that compartment? Just I, we, we were uh, around 120 degrees Fahrenheit, was 50 <coughs> degrees C or so. so. Okay. It felt hotter in the cockpit. <laughs> we're, right now we're using this system to collect the air data that I mentioned, um, uh, to supply an output pulse to a zero uh, bridge amplifiers for the strain gauges or the uh, industrial sensors I have for pressure feedback on the outside and uh, and uh, uh, 
accelerometers. So those are the modules that we have in there right now. I'm going to replace this read relay unit with a solid state relay. Now that I know that it exists, thank you very much uh, to someone who pointed that out today. And uh, then we won't have to worry about vibration triggering a reset on my uh, amplifiers. Home brewed um, uh, uh, total pressure, static or static pressure force, measuring the, the dynamic changes, dynamic changes in pressure uh, with speed, um, and had to build that from scratch. Made the made the printed circuit board, populated it with the amplifier, the uh, the sensors, and then routed these tubes to various locations around the fuselage, um, and where they come into the fuselage and they're cut flush. So it's absolutely flush and they measure the pressure, air pressure at various points. And that's what we're going to do. That's what we use to uh, see if our CFD is working or not. Let me see what the next slide is. Good. These are the next run. October, hopefully between 600 and 630 miles per hour. I will be taking uh, air data at these points in the fuselage and correlating them to the pressure um, that we expect to see at those points. And these are the, these are the um, uh, shock waves that are generated as we approach the speed of sound. Uh, we should start to see the, the formation of the shock waves above about 6 to 630. Um, it won't be strong, but it, we should be some indication of them. And it'll, it'll give us a warm, fuzzy feeling about our model. Um, is that on this on the fuselage, I'll go back here. These three points right here, very difficult to get. I can crawl through the fuselage or, or climb around and find these areas and get tubes to them very easily. Those three areas, I had to make a surface mount uh, open. It's in Devco, um, a Megat um, surface mount, 8510 or 8500 series uh, sensor. You get them. They, they sell them to, to aerospace people. For, doing the exact same thing I'm doing here. But we had to get really creative. I had to get really creative late one evening with the Dremel tool and routing these wires. I, I actually used, this is a, I said this is an old F-104 Starfighter. We no longer have hydraulic systems running flaps and gear and stuff. So we have a bunch of hydraulic tubes that aren't used. I routed wires through the unused hydraulic tubes to get back to this area. And uh, of course, it's an awful, awful, awful noisy environment. That um, that turbine engine is electrostatic generator in itself. Plus, it's got spark generators to uh, to allow ignition. Um, the airframe is aging aluminum, and what happens to aluminum as it ages? Aluminum oxide, which is a great insulator. So we've got insulated joints all over the place. It is the ground is a grounding nightmare. You, you can't get rid of the noise. So the amplifiers have to be really close to the sensors. And then I then the amplified signal, the mobile signal was sent back to where I can get it with the, uh, the compact DAC. So I found a little hole in between the skins here. There's an inspection panel that opens up where we take the smallest person on the crew and three of us pick them up like this and we shove them in. No, I'm not kidding. And until just his feet are sticking, he or she's, her feet are sticking out and they're in there with the flashlight, turning the blades on the turbine to see if there's any damaged blades. Who are we now? Who's our smallest person now? I don't know. I think we're going to have to recruit one. I I get my Brandon. 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 Yeah, Brandon, our, 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 our director of IT at 16 years old. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah, we don't dare lose him. <laughs> That's true. But well, we usually take a rope and put it around their ankle so we can pull them back out. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the, the point is, I had to figure out how to get those amps in there. Um, that is plumber's putty. I didn't know whether that was going to work or not. Turns out it's going to work really well. Ah, yes. There's my bear skin. We, we. Problem with a with an old 104 is that it, without it didn't come with any of the any of the guts. We didn't have a a, a, a differential uh, amplifier, a differential uh, airspeed. Um, differential pressure transducer, connected to the pitot tube for the airspeed, so I had to make an amplifier. And uh, so, does it work? I don't know. 
can't can't just go out there and run that thing and hope it works. So we see. Uh, and this is, the, as far as I know, is the only 19, uh, 2006 um, uh, Subaru Baja with a pito, pito tube. Um, but it worked. You should have seen us in the early days of testing our parachutes when we put them in the back of a pickup truck and went down the runway at Spanaway Airport as fast as we could and had somebody blow up a chute out to see what would open. <laughs> a bunch of clowns out there did something horrible. I can't wait for the movie. Wait a minute, I've lived it. Maybe I don't want to see it again. Um, it, it, yeah, it, this uh, two and a half miles of straight backcountry road um, was needed to get that thing. I, I won't tell you how fast I was going, but I do have data over 100 miles per hour. Um, <laughs> um, and but here, I'm, this, I said a secret ingredient because I want, I want to lose. Now, if you already know the answer, I mean, because I told you, uh, I don't want any participation. But I go down the road and I collect the data and, and understand it, what, how pedo, pedo tube works. It's got, uh, it's got air uh, sensors on the side, which is their static port. You've got a pressure port in the front. And, it, and you're essentially measuring the difference between the two pressures. The faster you go, the higher the difference and the higher the airspeed. Um, so, Get the data, look at it, and you know, and and it's a instead of getting a line, it looks like this. I get a line, it looks like this. It's just fat. It's just nothing but noise. It's just oh god, it, it was just nothing but noise. It there was a trend. I mean, I could have averaged it, but you know, you do electronic filtering, it's just a lie, right? Uh, you're, you're you're kidding yourself. Um, so what do you do? What, what does? I figured what what in the world was this? And this is this is not a noisy environment, and it, it, I've got a battery. Uh, it's not a power supply problem. It turns out it was sonic. It was it was noise. I mean, and, and the, the example best example I have is if you're riding a bicycle, and you hear the rush of the air past your ears. What do you do to, so you can hear? You turn your head like this. You know, you don't have the turbulence going over your ear, and it, you can suddenly hear and talk to the person behind you. But uh, so I think well, this, is, this is just sonic noise. It's, it's, it's not just picking up static pressure; it's also picking up a roar of the noise. Um, I'm, I'm getting audio. Well, uh, audio filter. And how, do, how do I tell? It, is it an average? What's, what's the deal? You know. Then I started thinking about the kind of the precepts of data acquisition and, uh, and getting rid of filtering anything. Now, the last thing you want to do is electronically filter. And the first thing you want to do is get rid of the source of the noise. The second thing you want to do is use a mechanical filter if you can. Because there, there's no, it doesn't lie to you, there's no, there's no aliasing problems or, or anything like that. Then I started thinking about the bicycle thing. Any ideas how to solve the problem? Did you turn it sideways? No, <laughs> good okay. idea, but do it. Noise canceling, noise canceling headphones? Noise canceling <laughs> headphones is a good answer. Yeah. I stuffed an earplug in the tube. <laughs> Amazing results, really nice, and I'm really surprised that it worked as well as it did. And if, if you're to pick, take, put your mouth on the hose that suck, you can't feel any air going through it. You, you'd think that it, that it would lock, but it actually is extremely responsive. Uh, it works well. Then I'm, I'm a big big discovery by me. You know, I'm going to go back to work at Boeing and talk to her. Yeah, duh. You know, they sell those commercially. You know. <laughs> but I don't have three hundred dollars each to do that. So, yeah, question number. Wasn't that tube designed to be open for a reason? Not have a plug in it? Well, yeah, we I, I put it, it's open to allow pressure past it. So but it's like but an open cell phone. Open, yeah, well, it's it's a open enough. I mean, you put these plugs in your ears, these you can still hear. Right. So it's just just a, it's a mechanical filter. So and it really cleans things up. Uh, did just a snapshot of some of the other um, wiring things. Um, we, we string gauge in the parachute. Um, 
was me and, um, messing with the wires to go back to the accelerometers that I had on the axle and uh, the stick position and a voltage divider there on the, on the mechanism that attached to his control stick. Uh, I tried with triggering early on. Triggering is a disaster out there because you, know, you, get, you either get false triggers or you get no triggers and nothing in between. Um, you try to laser tack on the dusty environment, hot blazing sun, lasers are no good. Um, so the solution, believe it or not, is manual triggering and connectivity. Just to make an example of uh, this is before we fix the problem and shows stick position and versus um, steering box position. And when Ed was fighting it and, and actually what, what we one thing we learned is um, although this was uh, out of calibration, it was very responsive. He didn't have to hardly, I mean, he, he moved a little bit and, and it was actually moving the steering box very re reliably. Um, so it was highly, respond, was highly responsive and uh, well we sorted this thing out now and we should actually have the lines uh, really closely close together, I hope. What happens when you lose control of steering, Ed? <laughs> yeah, we had a problem with our hydraulic design early on, and uh, turned out we were gas supplying the hydraulic oil in our steering system, and at about 300 miles an hour, I went behind the fire truck. And I was supposed to be about a half mile out on the track, but I went behind him going off to somewhere else. And that forced us to rethink our entire hydraulic system and redesign it and, uh, and build a new system that now works. But uh, yeah, we learned a lot about hydraulics that we didn't think we had to learn, but now we know. Um, just another just an example. I found the shot and said, oh, I'd be interested in this. Here's, here's my 10,000 G PCB, PCB 10,000, plus or minus 10,000 G accelerometer. Why so high? Because the plus or minus 5,000 G accelerometer, I shook to death. <laughs> <laughs> These are the mid wheels. Uh, each are, there's a, a, a constant force spring, some elastomeric spring, that pushes these wheels down to about 500 pounds each on the ground to stabilize the middle. So it gets rid of an oscillating mode, or uh, up and down oscillating mode, it gets rid of a rocking mode, and also supports the middle structure. Now, early on, I, I was really concerned about the way that these guys had put this thing together, so I put uh, accelerometers all over the place. I had three uh, triaxial accelerometers everywhere. And what this is an animation uh, uh, that's driven by the, the accelerometers in one, one of the runs, and uh, of course amplified greatly to see uh, how much movement there was. And it was a good tool. Uh, made, made the wireframe and it was able to animate it with, uh, with data from the accelerometers. Uh, I think I had 20, 20, 20, or close to 30 accelerometers. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, but the point. What software did you use to do that? Uh, ME scope. No, it's not. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's it's a. Well, yeah, modal analysis, right? Modal analysis. Yep. And um, the, my point is, we really didn't see uh, examples of undamped modes that were giving us trouble. It didn't have a structural problems that we didn't uh, really identify. It, it would look like it was all uh, all um, uh, uh, force vibration, no resonant vibration. So we uh, was not. I was really concerned about these uh, trailing arms. Uh, we used to have a different system to hold the rear uh, together, and it was these trailing arms. I figured these things would be vibrating all over the place. It turns out they weren't. So that was a good tool. We don't have audio with this, unfortunately. It's a big. But the rest of it is a silent film. <laughs> this is a, uh, show you a, a run and a shoot deployment. 
And at the end of that, and a, a show of the, the graph, this is a low speed run we did out of El Mirage. And uh, watch two things. Watch the magnetic brakes up here, that gap, and watch for the chute deployment. And it will run again after this in slow motion so you can see it. Remember that? And you were, you were looking at those potholes. Uh, no, this is when we didn't have a shoot failure. That's right. But you, yeah. Yeah. Ed's reluctant to use the magnetic brakes at high speeds for good reason. There you go. It is hydraulic, hydraulically driven um, plate that moves uh, 27 rare earth magnets in close proximity to that spinning disc, creates eddy currents in the disc, and, and warms that disc up, and, and basically takes the kinetic energy out of the wheel. So when the car that's stopped by the chute uh, is, doesn't have a wheel that's still spinning when we come to a stop, you know, it's it, good. That's, a, that's a pretty good um, flywheel that we have. We we don't let the car stop the wheel, and the chute stop the wheel. We we stop it with any kind of brakes. Anyway, okay, I think it's going to show the slow mo just of the section of the chute coming out, and this was actually a chute failure, not a chute failure, but a, a, there. See the chute? There it goes like that. Uh, it's like oh, we didn't have a good charge on that one. Those that usually shoots out so hard that that the uh, that we get a tight we get a, we have a tight tether before it doesn't even hit the ground. It just Bam! It shoots out there, and then you know, you're, we're going to see the, uh, the beginning of the shoot. This is I, I cut it before it blossoms all the way, but you can see at the end here the shoot starting to open. The next run after that was when we had the shoot failure, and uh, and I also had a really good afterburner light, so we had a really good run going. And then with no parachutes, we used the magnetic brakes so hard to get stopped. The brake rotor's got up to 625 degrees. <coughs> Not good for aluminum that annuals at 350. <laughs> I also have a, 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 a global navigation satellite system. I mean, we get 20 hertz data that gives me accuracy uh, five millimeters, uh, within five millimeters horizontally and three millimeters vertically. Um, so it's an extremely good tool. This is low resolution information that's available to me uh, while it's being, the data is being taken. Uh, we're tracking here uh, 10 GPS satellites and nine Russian satellites and comparing that feed to a static station. It's just sitting there on the desert floor. So we're getting differential um, uh, uh, GPS globalizations and it gives us that kind of accuracy. Oh yeah. This was valid. Now, what drives this, of course, is uh, the, the reason to do this validation is, is me not trusting myself. I, I wrote the program to, to, to take the every 50 millisecond velocity information to give us information on speed, but I didn't trust myself. So we put one in a land speed vehicle down at Bonneville and ran it and compared it to the data from the official timing to see if we're even close. I didn't realize, and this comes down to the, the hardest day of work in my entire life, <laughs> or, or three days in my entire life, is, but we had to build this car out there. The engine came from one side of the continent. Go ahead, you tell it. You tell them about where, where, where uh, Mr. Green got all of his components. Well, the engine came from uh, Eggy Racing back in North Carolina. The uh, car came out of uh, Abbotsford, Canada. Most of the crew came from where we lived. Uh, you can see my son up there, he's kind of pretty much the crew chief 
he and another fellow named Calvin Dirks. But uh, they come to the salt flats. You know, remember, you got a whole year to plan this, a whole year to build your engine, a whole year to build your car. But we always wait until the last minute. I mean, we really pushed it to this extreme this time because we're putting the engine in for the first time in that car at the salt flats. You only have one week to race the car. I think we finally got to run the car by Tuesday or Wednesday. It was, and, and you know, tech inspection is the Friday before that. So uh, yeah, so it, it was a real uh, mishmash. On top of that, Steve and I chose to test the uh, and validate our data acquisition uh, or uh, Topcon system against uh, Southern California Timing Association's timing clocks. So we're doing that as well as getting the car ready. So it was a thrash from morning to night for several days in a row. Yeah. And well, and and Ed, Ed's, Ed's being a. Uh, let's see what we have here. Oh, I wanted to mention before I mention something else about this car that's kind of important you know, regarding you and that car. But uh, you know, does that? I mean, disasters are usually you know a lot of different things driving it. Um, I. I it was just one of those. It's just one of those weeks, one of those months. We had all that. I knew all this stuff was coming together down there, but fate would have it. I wasn't coming together real well because my budget was out. He lived like a bed went out in the desert. I did. We, it, my wife was going to go with me, but we couldn't afford the motel. And saying, but these guys come from Canada. They're going to have to be down. Got to do the one chance in a year to do it. Okay, so. Just like Jen Clampett, man, he just, just bundled up the truck with what I found inside the cover, you know, peanut butter and grits and potato chips, and uh, put my bedroll back there and my old pup tent from Boy Scouts, and I headed off. And I camped one night in the desert getting down there under a Joshua tree. I saw this trail going off over the hill. I said, ah, oh, perfect. Get over there and over around the corner and made myself a shower. Out of a... But anyway... That's the way that week went. During the, the week, the speed week, on Tuesday, he got the smell so bad we let him come in the, into town and take a shower. <laughs> enough, enough of that. Okay. Uh, a lot of work. Uh, uh, I won't get into it, but the, the OEM board I got from uh, for this uh, satellite tracking system was about this long, and I had to get it into something about like this. So I ended up uh, breaking it here and, and learned how to use wire wrap. Who here knows what wire wrap? Yeah, see, I love this audience. Yeah, hundred connections, wire wrap, and uh, there, there, there's the uh, there's ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. Uh, there, there, there's there's the antenna, uh, the uh, global navigation system, and there we go. This is what I'm going to talk about with Ed. 276.786 miles per hour, C class uh, GL, uh, which is the yes. Gas, gas, Lakester, and he holds the record right there because he was the yeah. Driver. yeah. Uh, to get in the 200 mile an hour club, you have to break a record at over 200 miles an hour. It took me 23 years to get that, so it doesn't come easy. So uh, anyone that uh, is wearing the red hat that says he's in the, in the two club, he's usually worked a lot of years to get there. Because yeah. remember, you have to to set a record against others that are probably smarter than you and maybe even wealthier than you that have been ahead of you. So getting that record is pretty uh, pretty exciting. Uh, the one little side note on that was you, know, you have to do a, a pass and you have to do a backup pass and the average of two. To qualify to make the second one, you have to break the record on the very first one and the average of two runs. The second run, I'm laying in the car getting ready to go and it starts raining. So I'm going, Oh goodness! And the uh, starter said, "Well, you want to run anyway?" And I said, "Well, that's what I came here for. Let's get it out of the way." And about that time, a bolt of lightning hits the track about a half a mile down there. And I think that's a good God, sign. God speaking to you one way or another. I don't know. <laughs> as soon as I think that's a good sign. So the starter says, "Well, the wind's blowing pretty hard across the track, about between the four and the five mile. So expect it." Okay, fine. So I push off and away I go. Uh, at the four mile, the star car, car starts pulling really hard. One, one side and um, okay so I got this the wheel peeled over and I'm, I see the five mile marker and the thing's really pulling hard so I'm just keeping my foot all the way to the, to the firewall obviously a strong wind yeah so I get up past the five and I uh, shut it off and throw out the parachutes and come to stop and I find my right front tire had gone flat <laughs> so I could have gone faster <laughs> there's next week 
Next week, we'll do it again. Yeah, you hear the, here, here's the results. Um, one thing I wanted to mention for, for any of the geeks out there that might be interested. Um, this little air, this little statement down here it causes more consternation than you would, you would know. That the, uh, the Southern California Timing Association has always measured time as the, the distance of time that travel between two points on the surface of you know, the start line and the finish line. When you're using GPS, you're measuring time, and you, you, time is, is, is absolute, and it's the, it's the distance traveled over time, not time traveled over distance. And think about it, the complications of finding out where a start, start line is and a, and a finish line is when you're talking about you know, points in time instead of points. And it gets to be argumentative, but I think we can overcome it. And we'll, hopefully, we will. Uh, this is one of the first um, applications of uh, GPS tracking uh, in racing for timing purposes. It's always been lights and crossing lights. So, you know, this is kind of like the beginning, beginning, beginning steps of hopefully getting that, in, you know, as part of the of the regular. Uh, standard operating procedure. There is a website called landracing.com and there's, there's quite a forum on all, all the racers and their opinions and ideas and things they're doing and so on. So I uh, threw this one up as a, a point of discussion thinking maybe we could convince these people to go to a GNS type system for timing instead of the, the old-fashioned lights with miles and miles of wires and all those things. And when you try to break the paradigm uh, you got a big argument, yeah. so it's still but an argumentative phase. During the uh, the um, keynotes, happy to see you know we, we've got it's going to happen, you guys. Eventually, obviously, everybody eventually is going to have something that's right on their iPod or their iPhone or whatever we're carrying around in five, ten years from now. That's going to give you just absolute accuracy, and time and lights are just going to be laughable. Like I can see it already. So we're not far from it because the, the technology exists it's just how to get to it it needs to be figured out so anyway uh yeah total success uh very happy about it there's the engine and the vehicle this is the uh, uh saga i won't spend too much time but there it is uh, the uh, the connectivity at uh, ethernet is what i'm using now i ride along with that but i'm sitting in my subaru and oh, the laptop uh, sharing the screen that's on his uh, on the laptop on his vehicle doing the data collection or monitor the front end of the data collection system. But we, I have to set up these towers every two and a half miles. One mile away from the track and uh, every two and a half miles. This is a tower I have erected in my backyard just before the neighbors called the FBI. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's the uh, here's the, one of our early towers. Uh, a forklift. How did we get a forklift out in the middle of the desert? I don't ever know, but we got it. And uh, it, I, Sean drove the thing across the desert. He didn't know there was a high gear. Oh, that's right. And he didn't know you could drive it forward, so he wrote, drove it in reverse for hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this has a high gear. You can have going 20 instead of 2. <laughs> Great stuff. Yeah. And uh, this is this is the, what we're using right now. It's an 18-foot pole with these you know, tropos uh, systems. And uh, there's a there's a story about uh, um, the supermodel uh, uh, Vicky Andrin um, as one of my star tower erection crew members. And uh, that's going to have to wait till the bar, I think. <laughs> it's amazing who will come out into the desert. I mean, it's, there's a supermodel shows up out there. Yeah, we. Yeah, we can make we which I'll see now. Uh, she's <laughs> Swedish. <laughs> um, this is a, just a map of uh, this is, happens to be Edwards, and this is a, a presentation I put together to show how the towers are arrayed on the desert floor um, with a one mile offset. You, one particular note is this angle. Since we have the tower mount or the uh, router mount in the front of the car, there's this big metal plate between the, the firewall and that's a nice shield which prevents transmission beyond that. So I can't have the towers too close to the track. That goes into shadow really fast. I put it a mile away, 
an extra half a mile of travel before I lose conductivity. So that's basically it. We've got a windmill set up to charge, to keep the batteries charged, uh, which I built. And the neighbors called the FBI. <laughs> I, I, I built them out of old uh, stepper motors and uh, and uh, windshield wiper uh, and DC motors um, from old trucks, and it works out pretty well. Until we have, until last time when we had a squall in the middle of the night, blew half of them over and broke them. But anyway, that's just what happens. Um, this is just an example, and this is a hey. I mean, this, 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 is the grade, this is the grade school uh, approach to, sh to figure out how fast it'll take us to go to 800 miles per hour. And we just take, you know, obviously the acceleration at 30 miles per hour. And how long did it take us? That was a two second after burn, after burn burst. And if, if, if the curve was linear, which it's not, um, it would, you know, that's 53 seconds and 5.8 miles. And that was early uh, before we really had the thing tuned. So, and this is actually a really low speed run. But um, this slope and this deceleration slope are very important to know because it tells us how much track we need to do this and, and, uh, and do it safely. So this is an example of the application of the global navigation satellite uh, data. And I hear that someone's going to help me interface that system with the, uh, the compact DAC so we can get data uh, uh, that whole thing integrated, and I get that, that, that stream, and then I don't have to be starting one and you know, dancing <coughs> around and, and trying to get all these separate data acquisition systems going. Because that, actually, that uh, TopCon system has uh, got a lot of good I.O. I just don't know how to get to it. Question? Yeah, uh, would it have been possible to do the communication through satellites, or is that too slow or too late? No, because I, I, I think satellites would have worked. <clears throat> I just didn't have the ability to do it. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I I don't see. We have a, one problem with Ethernet is it doesn't like Doppler shift. Um, so we start going fast, I lose it. So I can't be with them all the time. Um, so even though uh, I am logging everything locally, I, I, my control is is via Ethernet. Um, but you're right. Um, I'm thinking kind of out of box there. But yeah, since we've got Geosynchronous orbit, the the, uh, the the angle, uh, the angular velocity is pretty low. You're not going to have much of a Doppler shift, so that would probably work. Honorable mention. Remember that? I, I didn't know I was going to be presenting to National Instruments when I dug out my old uh, 2120 uh, multifunction DAC from National Instruments, and I, I made a uh, canard controller, a uh, closed loop controller for actually in a canard uh, hydraulically uh, spread out the the, uh, the uh, plastic sheets in the in, in uh, my computer room upstairs to contain the inevitable oil spill and uh, and uh, develop that and it actually worked out pretty good various inputs uh, airspeed being the key one and and nose position i've since learned after talking to the SC, uh, thrust ssc team uh, who are, we partied out uh, in the desert once with to celebrate the 10th year of breaking the record we're trying to break. Um, that uh, active control is just a bad idea. Um, try, if, if the nose starts to rise and you counteract it with a, with a, a down force, you're changing the aerodynamic characteristics. And you don't know from sensing whether that movement in the nose was caused by running over something or something that's changed in your aerodynamic characteristics of the whole situation. If something aerodynamic is happening, that's, that's good. But if it, he runs over a rut, it goes like this, he goes like this, well, that's, now we've got, a, we've got a control oscillation problem. Um, and the Brits found that out. They ended up disabling their active control system. So it, it would be slave to it. We'd figure it out exactly what it's supposed to be in the computer, and we'd match it to uh, the position to airspeed only. And uh, if anything starts to go wanky, we just throw out the chutes and stop and you know, figure out what happened. Try it again. I want to leave a lot of time for questions. Where are we at? Probably about a half hour or so. <laughs> hey, we're <laughs> supposed to go home now. Oh, yeah.
Okay. We, got a, we got a lower truck. One question. <laughs> Anyone have a question before question. we close this thing up? Oh, come on, guys. Put the good question down. <laughs> Yes. Yes, because the, at, at that that's the that's the exit velocity versus yeah. the and go ahead and answer that. Well, you get time you know, from each you know mile marker to mile marker, mile to marker. But at the very end, we have what they call a terminal velocity indicator, and that is I don't know exactly how they measure that or what they measure it with, but I suspect some kind of an uh, instantaneous. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think they still have two lights that are about ten feet apart. Yeah, right? it could instead of a mile yeah. apart. So you know, average over a mile and what happened over ten feet. So, uh, and I'm measuring average distance between twenty hertz ticks. Yeah. We're going to have a really good run and see if you run uh, two hundred and seventy-six miles an hour, but the terminal velocity says this was uh, two hundred and eighty. I was going to two eighty. <laughs> Anyway, uh, thank you for your attendance, um, and uh, you know you can always email questions too. And um, it's it's just it's been a great it's been a great week. I mean, you guys have been wonderful. I mean, great audience, wonderful questions, uh, great interest. I mean, you know, couldn't have been any better. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.